Hello, everyone, and welcome to the July 2021 Cinegrid Community Forum. Uh, people are still joining. Uh, uh, we'll get started uh, as they come in. Uh, I'm Lauren Hare. I'm sitting in Oakland, California, and uh, people are spread around. Uh, around. So these are the community forum sessions of Cinegrid, which are just monthly sessions on topics of interest at the intersection of media and AI that we initiated in 2021. Uh, Cinegrid itself has a history going back to 2005. And for about 10, 12 years, we ran really fun annual workshops at uh, uh, UC San Diego. But uh, uh, during the pandemic, certainly we can't meet in person. So we've gone virtual. And uh, every month we've had uh, very interesting presentations. And we recorded all of those presentations and made them uh, accessible in the Cinegrid Exchange. Um, we are going to we are recording this presentation as well, and it'll be accessible to you, uh, you know, uh, within a few days after the today's event. Uh, the speakers have uh, been kind enough to also uh, offer us uh, uh, copies of their slides to share with you after the fact, and we'll also share a list of people who have joined. All right, and so. Uh, we have an ongoing calendar uh, in August, uh, August 10th and 11th. Uh, our friend and colleague, Alvy Ray Smith, who's here today, will give a presentation about his new book, The Biography of the Pixel, which uh, goes back to the first principles and brings us forward in a sweeping pages of prose all the way to the present, or close enough in a wonderful book. And uh, registration is now open. Uh, uh, there's a link and uh, we'll send that link out again in the email uh, after today. September 20th and 21st will be the next session. And we're very pleased to uh, that the founders of Algosoft, uh, Ina Koslov and Alex Petikov, I'm sorry if I don't pronounce them correctly, the founders of Algosoft uh, have agreed to present on recent advances in improving the quality of motion pictures through AI and deep learning. Uh, they're most well known for their uh, uh, software to do film restoration, uh, but they're uh, applied mathematicians who have been working in this field for a number of years and doing very, very interesting work. And then in October, uh, we're going to, uh, uh, we've got Greg Harper has agreed to come back uh, uh, last month, when we heard about Sage 3, Greg was bubbling with ideas and uh, news about what he's doing in distance learning and remote collaboration. And uh, his talk is scheduled for the week after NAB. And so uh, he's agreed to talk about the latest audio and video tech for remote collaboration and distance learning, kind of following on from Sage on that theme. Today, uh, we're going to hear about advancing imaging technology to reveal secrets in plain sight. We have a very illustrious uh, set of presenters. Mark Ellisman, uh, Distinguished Professor of Neurosciences and Director of National Center for Microscopy and Imaging Research, which is known as NICMER, at the University of California, San Diego. Uh, uh, longtime uh, uh, visualization pioneer. And Ilke Altinas, uh, Chief Data Science Officer, and a long list of other titles at uh, San Diego Supercomputing Center to talk about composable systems. And Matthew Madani, who's a researcher at NICMER, to talk about a case study that he did and how it actually all comes together when you're responsible for like finishing the idea. And with that, um, we'll have Q&A at the end. Uh, uh, we have... Uh, 15, 20 minutes reserved for Q&A. So hold your questions. And uh, with that, I'm gonna give up my screen share and uh, turn it over to uh, Mark Ellisman, Professor and Director of NICMER. Thank you, Mark. And everybody, if you would please uh, mute your microphone when you're not speaking, and uh, I'll do the same. Mark, uh, you're up. 
Good afternoon, morning, evening. I'm not sure where the audience is distributed, but uh, thanks for the invitation. Uh, I hope to give you a little bit of an introduction to uh, some of the things that we do and uh, perhaps introduce how we've worked with uh, workflows and distributed uh, uh, operating systems, if you like. Uh, but I'll leave that mostly to Ilke and uh, Matthew Madany. I'll show you uh, the challenge as a brain researcher of finding things that are otherwise hidden, kind of like looking for those important things in the jungle when the jungle is so dense you can't walk through it. That's your brain. But there are exceptions. Uh, as you can see from the, uh, the screen, not all brains are the same. Not all humans have brains. I think this is... Uh, become clearer and clearer in recent years. Um, so looking for how to progress these slides. There we go. Um, so we have many instances of brains that are of different size, different character. Uh, the challenge has been since the sort of beginning of working on the brain of finding uh, ways to enhance certain subcomponents like neurons, the nerve cells that form the wiring, if you like, of the brain. And it's been said, and I think it's appropriate uh, uh, way to think about it, that the gain in brain is mainly in the stain. That if you're able to highlight subcomponents, you're able to follow very interesting patterns and maybe infer something about function. That's what this fellow uh, more than a hundred years ago uh, did, Ramon de Cajal. He was able to use a method of soaking uh, brain tissues in kind of a silver solution that for reasons we still don't understand, highlighted subsets and the ideal preparations he would then look at uh, in a microscope, didn't have cameras at the time, so he made drawings. That's what he's doing on his little notepad there. And then he'd go to the bar across the street and uh, drink a bottle of red wine and finish the drawings. Uh, earned a Nobel Prize for his work. Uh, good uh, job if you can get it. But he was able to infer how neurons might connect, what the direction of signals might be, even though he was looking at dead tissue. Modern neuroscience or modern biology has to deal with the knowledge we have all the way to the atoms for this toxin molecule. It's the powers of 10 type diagram, if you see my mouse move. And you see protein structures with all of the patterns that proteins make out of their atoms. The powerhouses inside of cells, mitochondria, synapses, where the connections are made between neurons little knobs on the end of their processes, kind of like the fine uh, branches of a tree. This would be one of the full trees. This would be a glial cell. We'll talk about those. And those fit into these pattern things that you see beautiful arrays of that are slices through parts of the brain, in this case, the cerebellum, and on out. We have lots of non-invasive imaging methods now. We have modern microscopies that cross these scales. But we have a problem because the spatial scales have gaps that are not filled by current technology. And in fact, at any one of these regions where we can collect data with great richness with some modern automated techniques I'll show you, we really can't go out to full brains. One of the big initiatives you'll hear about in the next few years will be to map entire mouse brains, kind of like the human genome was done probably by the Department of Energy, all the way to the wiring through entire brains. This is probably gonna be a project that'll take 15 years just for a few mouse brains, just to see the fine connections, these little parts. But again, there'll be gaps, uh, it'll be sputtery. The techniques haven't been developed. It's right now in the stage I'd call similar to the uh, early flight 
where people are still trying to build uh, lighter than air aircraft to solve this scale problem. Then if you look at the temporal scales, if you look at molecules, proteins, their components are moving in femtoseconds. If you look at development, you're dealing with lifespans. So you have a huge range of temporal scales operating on top of all this spatial information that's also poorly characterized. As you go to smaller and smaller piece parts, we have less correlated temporal information. And then we don't pay any attention to the cells that don't send signals from one to another, the glial cells, which actually make up more than half the brain and are probably where your soul resides. I'm being controversial or at least trying to evoke some thoughts. We focus on the wiring. We don't focus on the resident cells that support it. So in modern uh, biology, we try uh, neurobiology to focus on both these neurons like the Hall did and the glial cells, which look like this tumbleweed, one reason they're hard to study, and their role in health and disease and just the core functions of the nervous system, which is a low energy uh, memory machine with an identity. Now the glial cells increase in ratio, in other words, the number of glial cells per nerve cell, as you go from very simple organisms, leech to human, whenever you find a connection, a synapse between one nerve cell and another, you find a glial cell kind of nursing it and mediating a lot of the metabolism. This goes wrong in Alzheimer's disease, but some of the most extreme examples that we know of, extreme performers, have extra glia, and we don't know why. Very reputable group of scientists analyzed Albert Einstein's brain, published a paper showing he had more glial cells, more astrocytes. I work across scales, and I've had several experiences where uh, we've worked with animators. I'm showing this little movie because I want someone in the audience to tell me what movie it was from. It starts inside of a synapse. And we're moving to lower and lower magnification. In this Hollywood animation, the animators were able to put the electrical activity in, of course, by uh, inference as blinking lights. So now we're traveling across the spatial scales I showed you. Anybody guess the movie? Shout it out. Is it the Pixar movie? The, no. uh, nice try. This is uh, the inside of Edward Norton's brain. It's the opening sequence of Fight Club. And uh, we worked with Mike Canfer in Digital Domain to make this movie, or at least this opening sequence. Those of you who liked the movie, we're coming out now through a hair follicle to a drop of sweat as it drips onto the barrel of the gun before Edward Norton pulls the trigger to try and get Brad Pitt out of his brain. Well, that movie, just that 90 seconds cost $6 million to do the animation, it probably cost more now. And uh, even though it was fun for me to be able to use the data, they took the astrocytes out to have the camera have a place to be. So it wasn't a very accurate depiction, despite all the work of me trying to get them to put the, all the cells in, they used uh, what you call artistic license. The way data are taken, all the data that I showed you before that movie, is usually by using a genetic probe, something like green fluorescent protein or something more sophisticated that we built with Roger Chen and others, to label, to give that kind of uh, selective staining so that the game can be 
uh, from having a highlight. Then we build microscopes at the National Center with commercial entities. We add our patented technologies to commercial microscopes, sell the patents, including new kinds of cameras that count electrons directly. And then we build analytical methods in order to make those models that come from this model <clears throat> from new probes and uh, new microscopes to look inside of cells, to look at cells aggregating, uh, and so on. The methods that we most often use nowadays are high energy electron microscopy to look through thick slabs to rebuild, for example, this vestibular hair cell, which is what you use to determine your position. The cell rocks, the top of the cell tips back and forth as you move around. And so investigators working with us look at the energy from the mitochondria, look at the stiffness of different components, the molecules. Another technique is to make a fancy kind of bologna slicer inside of the vacuum of the scanning EM and just keep cutting away and then segment. Again, these dendrites, you see the knobs, that's where 90% of the synapses are made. They're called dendritic spines. And those are the vesicles. You can make those kinds of models quite handily now. These are well distributed tools. There are probably two, 300 of these around the world creating these kinds of small volumes of data. So those are two methods, electron tomography, serial block face scanning EM. The serial block face scanning EM can be used to look at the shell or the outer surface of neurons to extract it. Matthew will show you more of this. So this is one of the larger neurons. These are dendrites, primary, secondary, tertiary, quaternary, and then you see the little knobs where the connections are made. This is the output, the axon. It's gonna send the signal to the next part of the brain. Or you can go inside and look at all of the guts, if you like, of the cell, the nucleus where the DNA is, the membrane systems that manage calcium or provide ATP energy. And you can make models of all of these things and then do computations to determine who's next to who, and how does the flow of met metabolites uh, move between these? You can see these are uh, published papers generally. Well, we're not the only ones to think about the dynamics in the context of what are usually static images because of the characteristics of uh, microscopes. They don't usually allow this kind of resolution to be obtained from living preparations. So Francis Crick, who's most famous for his work uh, discovering the structure of uh, DNA or the genetic code, speculated uh, back in uh, the early 1980s, so uh, 40 years ago, that maybe the little knobs that Cajal had described, these dendritic spines, had the same machinery inside of them that we know is responsible for your muscles contracting. Pure speculation. He said, do spines twitch? Maybe when you're thinking, your brain is twitching at these little knobs. We and others validated that. We know now that when you sleep, your spines get smaller. When you're awake, they get larger. So there's at least a daily cycle. And there are many other investigations showing they change shape. Here's an example using the uh, 3 million volt, the world's uh, most powerful electron microscope in Osaka, which my team uh, uh, made a remotely useful instrument, actually uh, resulted in me meeting the emperor who was so impressed with what we've done to make this a international resource. So she's loading the sample and then uh, we would operate it from San Diego. Uh, but this is a set of dendritic spines on a neuron from a mouse model of fragile X, which is uh, one of the more common forms of mental retardation. And you can see the spines are very non-uniform in shape. 
here's one of those spines. You can see the head, the neck, and this is where it connects to the shaft. But now we've skipped to very high magnification. The distance from here to here is 40 nanometers, 400 angstroms, 400 hydrogen atoms. This is where the receptors are. This data set is obtained by tilting the sample and taking about 4,000 projections, fusing them using pretty sophisticated math running on high performance computing resources. And we're now moving a few angstroms per plane, the same way you'd step through an MRI or CT scan, but we're down at the molecular structure. If you pick one of the domains where the receptors are, you can actually see the receptors. These are the neurotransmitter receptors. They're about 10 nanometers in diameter. And you can see the pore where the ions go in the middle, the little black dot. Okay. So calcium and sodium goes through that pore when your neurotransmitter, let's say acetylcholine or glutamate, activate that little pore to open. But let's go back to Crick's idea about these things twitching. So here you see several slabs reconstructed using one of these high energy electron microscopes, docked and aligned. Just the docking and alignment takes quite a bit of computation. But you can go from there to computer graphic representation of that by segmenting, including all the actin inside. Actin is one of the molecules involved in muscle contraction. And then that red spot is where the synapse would be made on this. How do you do this? You have to use some pretty sophisticated methods for erosion, plane by plane, same sorts of tools that are used to follow streets in complex European cities. This is done with a group that we collaborate with out of the supercomputer center in uh, Germany. And then you can see all the act in, in the spines. And what we do is we say, all right, we've done a pretty good job of finding the actin threads and the branch points. Let's now go to the protein data bank where other uh, scientists have determined where all the atoms are on this muscle protein. And let's install that from the sort of Lego set we, we mine, the library, if you like. So these are actin molecules all the way down to their atoms. Why do we care? Because actin has got a lot of negative charges. And so this makes this lollipop very acidic. It means that water is gonna be organized in here, kind of like in a state of uh, uh, stasis. And when ions rush in, the water is gonna be released because the ions are gonna displace the water from the charged surface of the actin, and the spine is going to pop in size just by the increased water mobility. So maybe Crick was right, but not contraction, more having to do with the concentration of an acidic protein and its reaction to a very large influx of calcium and sodium. As Tom DeFonte and others uh, who may be uh, listening know, uh, we've worked a long time from the beginning of the San Diego Supercomputer Center on graphics. We worked with Tom and company when uh, they came to San Diego and Dan uh, Sandine on some of the advanced graphics. This is uh, one of the students that worked between us, Iman Mostafavi, working, and I think Tom can identify this, uh, you'll see coming up as a uh, some of the more advanced technologies. I think this was called Varier, Dan. So Iman is looking, uh, sorry, these, this is old enough to have the emollients between the screen, but he's in a passive 3D environment manipulating a 3D scene. He's grabbing data from multiple sources and putting it together. This was a great proof of concept. Unfortunately, Iman decided to start a, uh, video game company about a month before he defended his thesis. Uh, and I decided to wait for the uh, 
the web browsers to develop and catch up uh, with 3D. We eventually started a project uh, funded by Ted Waite, uh, uh, the founder of Gateway, to try and do something. We called it the whole brain catalog. The idea was to have a repository, but in a web uh, representation of the whole brain. We use a brain model, came from Paul Allen's Institute, the Allen Brain Institute, with the idea that just like uh, Google made the Google Maps, we would consider the microscopes, which are all remotely oper operating, as sources for microscopes around the world to put little pieces into this larger map. Kind of like doing your home wiring or your plumbing in your street view uh, of your house. Uh, so we built that infrastructure on an open source game engine that was open source for a while, then Google dropped it. Uh, it was a good project. We did make another movie that was a lot cheaper than the one that Hollywood uh, uh, worked on with us to announce the whole brain catalog. This is about the time that Waits uh, Amelia came out. We got better reviews than his movie. But it's zooming through the whole brain. We wanted to show the tyranny of scale, if you like, the challenges. We wanted to put electrical activity in more accurately than had been done in the uh, Fight Club intro. And we wanted to try and use the music to help show the challenges of changing temporal scales. So I hired a composer, Francois Tetzoff, who actually, right after this uh, work with us, won a, uh, a Grammy for his composition, not for this movie. But it moves in a region of the hippocampus where the electrical activity is associated with short-term memory where neurons branch and make new partnerships. And as we dive in, you'll begin to see the little structures that I described as dendritic spines that have plasticity that Crick was interested in. Now we're gonna change cadence of the, mu of the music. We're moving to what we call the dance of the spines. So these spines need a certain level of input to keep the neuron at a properly uh, frequency. So if they're not getting enough input, they go out searching for another input. So they send out little finger-like processes looking to hook up. They find a suitable axon that's going to sprinkle it with transmitter, but not without the participation of, yes, the astrocyte that kind of nurtures. It's the yenta in this process. Making the connection. So this is our fantasy based on a little more data than the Fight Club video. So I hope you can see that we deal with very large data even though we're only looking at bits and pieces. The to be continued was funding was to be continued, but the global financial crisis uh, sort of quashed my source for this. But we did get the movie. Anybody who wants the movie can write me. There have been lots of people involved. Matthew, see your name is there. And with that, I think I'll turn it over to Ilke, unless there's some questions. We're going to Thank take questions you. at the end, Professor Ellisman. Um, yeah. I've asked people to queue them up in the Q&A if they, if they have them currently. 
Good. Booked. Now, Lauren, you have to guess what room I'm in. It's definitely not the fight club. <laughs> so, Mark is a hard act to follow. Now, welcome to the boring part. <laughs> um, joking aside, I think Mark's talk really demonstrated that um, there is a huge infrastructure and expertise that's needed for this type of work to happen. And we call that infrastructure cyber infrastructure. So this is about cyber in it, everything, you know, the things that are related to heterogeneous systems and data computing, uh, data management principles and the techniques and the systems uh, things build on. So how do we actually keep track of data uh, what goes into this? How do we manage it? How do we analyze it using data-driven methods? And all of this has to be done through a multidisciplinary workforce and scalable tools and infrastructure. So it's very collaborative. And as you know, grid computing itself uh, required a lot of collaboration, both at the social and technical level. And very few people can do this, turns out. Uh, it's no surprise at that time, uh, you know, there was this collaboration between the movie makers and the science. Uh, I'm always really impressed by that when I think about how early this was done in Mark's uh, center. And there is a lot of data that's involved. It's massive imaging data. It's a lot of data and a lot of effort in terms of computational effort and the computing needs that's needed. But the idea here is how do we distill that data and optimize use of high performance computing resources and these days um, different architectures to deal with this. But the thing is, when we can analyze this, if we can analyze this at a scale and prepare the data for use by different communities, and uh, some of this has been discussed in Mike Mark's talk as well, we are amplifying the use of it. We are amplifying the reach to it. We are amplifying the knowledge we have about that data set and what we can actually gather uh, about that data set. And this enables further science, this enables further education, this enables further use overall. So more communities uh, can have access to it. Its visualization can be commoditized with links to the larger, more detailed data sets. So how does this happen? That's what we refer to that roughly to these days as the AI. So taking the data, annotating with the semantic structures, making sure we can understand uh, parts of this data in a way that enables uh, the use of data in different modes. Uh, we sometimes refer to these as insights gained from the data. Uh, in this case, it would be scientific insights um, and sometimes referred to that as uh, you know, understanding or creating knowledge from data. And that knowledge is supposed to drive further action using the data. So, you know, AI is the buzzword of our time, at least these days. Um, and how do we integrate that? Which in in includes data management again, machine learning, use of HPC. This is all to drive some intelligence through data. So, how do we integrate that into imaging research like this, or in general, uh, any research that what we now refer to as the digital continuum? Why the digital continuum? Because we can now, we generate more data, access to higher resolution uh, computing. The, 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 what I mean by higher resolution computing is we can compute at the edge, we can compute on a cloud, we can compute on an exascale environment. So that's the full continuum. And we can, at times, compute across these different modes. And that enables us to actually integrate heterogeneity, both in terms of the techniques and also in terms of what we are using uh, to compute on the data, to generate insights from the data. So what's the typical, you know, that heterogeneity, I'm going to refer to it as heterogeneous processes in the form of workflows. 
And this goes from the data collection and observations. This could come from, you know, instruments like imaging instruments. This could come from cameras out there. This could come from uh, many different sensors, so to say, that gives us data about uh, the brain in this case, or the environment, uh, or many other biological features. And there needs to be some machine learning and AI applied to that data. So we understand what's in the sensed environment, what's in the data we are actually uh, observing or gathering through uh, different uh, facilities and instruments. And in most of the scientific cases, that understanding helps us to understand what's interesting about the science and what else we can actually learn through simulation or ensembles of models about the scientific phenomena through physics-based, chemistry-based models. And if we can actually drive understanding through data as seamlessly as possible, as we gather new data, as we acquire new data and apply that to simulations, we are Well, it turns out if we were to do this seamlessly, we are going to require different types of capabilities. When we talk about AI and big data and edge computing, we are talking about different capabilities that includes different processing units, like graphical processing units is a big one lately. Um, quantum processing is coming up. Tensor units that Google Cloud uh, enabled us to use on, on different AI libraries are as a part of that. There's these FPGAs, field programmable gate arrays that are very specific to certain computations, but they are very uh, get, gaining popularity uh, to um, sort of bridge the gap between how much data we are gathering and you know, the need for gathering insight or generating insights from that data really fast. And there's the edge units that combines sensing and AI through uh, what we refer to as uh, different accelerators. So you can actually have edge devices that compute on the data as they are uh, on higher resolution data than we can today. And then downstream, when we look at coupling these type of work to um, simulations, we are looking for capacity, the supercomputing capacity at that time. And being able to use both uh, is technologically uh, difficult or requires some further in, uh, innovations, so to say. And going from, let's say, something on the edge that requires downscaling of AI to something at the extreme scale that requires upscaling needs different ways to talk, uh, look at the computational stack and how we are putting systems together. So one system won't scale at all. And we are looking at distributed systems with different uh, capabilities and different capacity and of different nature in terms of their what they were built for. So how do we put all these together? That's what I refer to as composability and being able to compose different systems um, at the time of use Let's say we are training and inferring from the same data at the same time using capability and capacity at the same time requires dynamic behavior. So that's the dynamic composability of systems and the services running on systems within applications that can take advantage of those services as the data demands or as the application demands. And there's generally not one person doing it. Multiple people are working on uh, these type of capabilities and those groups uh, being able to integrate what they are doing into applications together requires different ways of building, uh, not just systems, but also environments that enable groups to use systems and services. So that requires further intelligence about teamwork and team science itself. So lots of new stacks we are seeing in the industry space. You know, wherever, whichever cloud you go to, you'll see an AI stack coupled to it, set of libraries, but it's still hard to work across those libraries. So that requires actually systems built on top of these different environments. And, you know, groups then will need to take advantage of those libraries as those libraries are needed 
by the applications that they are using. So that type of heterogeneity right now, both in the industry and scientific space uh, is very difficult to achieve. And this is an eye chart, but to show you, um, what we are talking about the yellow box here are the system services workflows that manage it and the whole data management life cycle. Those are more technical issues that needs to be solved and built. When we look at the blue boxes, now the crisis in the scientific enterprise actually due to wrongfully use of data or you know, being able to actually give control some of that to AI uh, requires further thought about you know, who is the collaborator? How are we enabling them? How do we reproduce? What are ethics and you know, privacy and explainability type of requirements? How responsible are we in building these systems and integration of services so we are not making harm? But more importantly, if you look at that top part, it needs to be use inspired. We need to actually start with the problems that we are solving and then move on to the systems and see how the systems respond to those problems. So the blue boxes are why we are building the yellow part. So we need to keep reminding ourselves we are trying to integrate solutions and in ways that are reproducible, responsible, and they are very use driven, use inspired. So you have seen a talk from Tom DeFanti and Larry Smar before on this, uh, on the Pacific Research Platform, uh, which enabled uh, networking capability and the capacity actually through that network, computing capacity through that network over the years called Nautilus. This is, as you might have heard, a 10 to 100 gigabyte uh, disk to disk connectivity through multiple campuses, even internationally. And a set of GPUs, a lot of GPUs, but gaming GPUs that can be useful for big data processing and inference on top of that network has become a cluster that's managed by the Kubernetes environment, which is called Nautilus. So this is a you know, cloud, so to say, a dynamic cloud of GPU resources and FPGAs are now added to it. Some edge, edge devices are added to it that has both data extensible data storage capability and also um, extensible bring your own device computing capability that could be added as a resource into this dynamically managed containers. And you know the ones that are on uh, the PRP on Nautilus are also Fiona's that Tom might have explained, but these are really high capacity big data processing devices. And it's built in a way uh, that can have a lot of storage over petabyte of storage, but also can be integrated with other cloud data lake uh, and containerized storage capabilities for scalability. Now, what we've done is we took this idea and said, okay, this is a way to add capabilities, FPGAs, GPUs, different processing units into a network, but what if we need supercomputing capability to be coupled to this? So that type of high capacity computing sometimes is needed for training, sometimes is needed for you know, inferring from data fast and coupling that to a simulation to do further analysis based on the analyzed data. But you know, dynamically in real time, this is very hard to achieve without a further thing that needed to be added to a supercomputing stack. So supercomputers generally have queues, batch queues, and you wait on a line and it's, you know, you compute on it when, you, when it's your turn. And in this case, what we've done is we reserved a part of the supercomputer in Expanse to be a Kubernetes resource that's dynamically expandable through uh, bright computing uh, CM scale. That part is actually in the works right now. Um, but based on that allocation, we can create a part of the supercomputer to be a Kubernetes cluster, just like Nautilus. And through federation of these two resources, we can now compute across what is on Nautilus and what's also on Expanse, on the high capacity nodes of Expanse. So then when we have new data training takes uh, some you know, uh, capacity 
and being able to do the training, capture that train model and infer at scale in a data parallel way on Nautilus is possible in an environment, in a setting like this. Matthew will explain to you how MICMAR has used. I'll give you a short example before I hand it over to Matthew. Uh, in one of the projects called Wi-Fire, um, we are coupling data science and fire science. So when we have new data, real-time data about the fires, we are able to learn from that data and couple it to fire simulations. That requires many different forms of AI, and one of them is collecting fire imagery from the cameras in real time, doing smoke detection, ignition location detection uh, with some uncertainty. And this then can be coupled into um, fire simulation models. Again, we are learning something from the data in real time and coupling it and parameterizing fire simulations based on that learning. So what we were able to do through the Expanse and Nautilus integration is when we receive data from these cameras, we can now do the inference from the data for smoke detection on uh, the JCI and do the computing of the fire modeling on Nautilus or Expanse itself. So that federated cluster becomes the smoke detection plus fire uh, simulation workflow. And this was a demonstration workflow that was done to describe or demonstrate the capabilities of Expanse. Another demonstration coupled this to a stage um, AI on the edge environment uh, on top of a network called High Performance Wireless Research and Education, HPREN. So we were able to then deploy some of these um, accelerated devices on HPREN and do inference on the edge and couple it through this network um, to uh, say Nautilus and Expanse. So that secret sauce here in this case is Kubernetes and the st stack of software that works with this environment. But it shows you by purposefully building these systems to couple environments that are used in a workflow environment, we can do that dynamic federation now. And we are working for systems, both at the storage and computing space that can now help problem solving and creating clusters of these heterogeneous resources um, in ways that respond to the needs of individual applications rather than you know, submit one simulation, massive simulation, wait on the queue, get the results back, then couple it. So it makes this uh, compute a lot more dynamically uh, than we did before. Uh, this doesn't mean um, you know, the traditional high performance computing uh, won't be uh, used, so it's very important. But this is one mode of computing when problems require a lot more heterogeneity and composition of resources. And Kubernetes and things like Nautilus and Expanse uh, stacks enable that in uh, sort of innovative ways that we'd love to work with. Uh, your community as well, if needed. I'm going to pass it over to Matthew because he's going to bring us back to the uh, imaging domain and how he's using Hello. these systems. Hello, is my voice clear? Can you let me know? It is. We can hear you. Um, yep. Thank you, Ilkai. Um, I'm going to take your spotlight and uh, wait for Matthew to start, and then I will spotlight him. Let me find him. Matthew, can you say something? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Am I spotlighted? Is that the go signal? I'm still, I'm still looking for you. Give me just a second. There we go. Okay. All right. Hi, everybody. I am Matthew Madany. I'm a developer at Nikmer, and I've been working between what Mark and Ilkai talked about between how do you deal with this large image data, the tyranny of scale, the complexity of biology, and how do you take the advantages of composable systems of clouds and AI and couple them in a way where you can say, well, in biology, it's, it's referred to as the science of exception. When you go into a mouse brain or a human brain, you'll find orders of magnitudes of different scales of the sizes of neurons complexities of the connections they make 
and in ways that for you to sit down and be like, well, I'm going to create an algorithm to reconstruct all of them. It's really, it's not possible in, in that most basic sense. And um, I actually spent a lot of time doing that initially on standard supercomputers. And I realized pretty quickly that it wouldn't work that way. And I, I transitioned more into these cloud hybrid um, systems where I realized that the power I could wield to tackle scientific computing was so much greater. Um, and it took, it took a long time to really be convinced of that. Um, and now I'm just an absolute acolyte of it. Um, so I'll, I'll go more into a uh, more exact visualization of what these algorithmic problems are and some AI applications, I've developed them, and then I'll go into how those all work in consorts together um, in multiple different computing providers and how, how complicated it may seem, but how usable and uh, practical it becomes. Um, so this is more of that electron microscopy data. Um, but when we when we ask these questions about tyranny of scale, we're really asking about 3D data and this idea that when you double X, Y, and Z dimensions, you're getting eight times more pixels. You know, every every scale you consider, if there's a major brain region that's twice as big as another, it's going to require an exponentially larger computation. When you when you look at supercomputers or single clusters, you you you're really asking the wrong question in a way. You're, you're you need you need to step back and think about what does it mean to be a processing resource. What does it mean for me to have to tackle different algorithmic problems in that some data sets can be, they can be labeled and stained in different ways. They can have different resolutions. They can have variations in their operating, standard operating procedures. You know, the biologist goes to prepare it, the microscopist goes to create the microscope, use the microscope in a way that produces the best possible pristine output, but it doesn't always end up that way. There's so many stages or little um, variations that can happen that affect your image. and how do you how do you take it into a resource space and a compute resource space and where all of the algorithms exist and work together that could attenuate for anything that could happen and each of them is vertically able to scale to whatever size of data whether you're looking at mapping a whole brain or doing these extremely fine synapse calculations across um, a bunch of little samples. So I show I'm showing some videos of just different different scale levels where you're you're um, incrementing across the the third axis. Um, one thing that's really important to emphasize here is that the third axis in microscopy is typically a much lower resolution than the XY, and that's mostly for throughput because you can get really fine details in XY. You can see all the synapses, but the third dimension is usually reduced or, or the cutting resolution is a little bit lower because you can get a lot more throughput. And that, that little relationship is what really enables you to acquire image volumes that contain entire neurons in their extents, but also are high resolution enough that you can see the synapses, the little connections between them huge scale difference between the two. One is a millimeter centimeter object, the other is a nanometer um, angstrom level object. Um, so the NeuroCube is something I build on the National Research Platform, which is um, based on a distribution of, of nodes across many institutions. I think there's been previous presentations on it, so I won't go too much into detail. Um, one of the, what I'm showing here is, is a software called Paintera that was developed at the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. And I'm showing you image data at, at a real end stage um, situation in which an AI has gone into this image, it's looked through billions of pixels and it's decided here's where axon one is, here's where dendrite two is, here's where neuron one is, here's where synapse 10 billion is. You know, it, it's this ridiculously enriched label space where you have, you have taken a 3D volume and put in you know, a, a, at least an inference based on a, on a group of AIs where, where the, struct, the neurological structures are. And once again, these, data, these original volumes could have come from, you know, some of them may have lacked resolution, they may have come from different species of, entirely, and so different AIs would have been composed along the way uh, to deal with that. So I first tried to do this on supercomputers. I said, hey, I, I have a scientific problem, I have a consort of different serial and sequential steps that could be used to reduce that problem and solve it. And I, I developed a different, a bunch of different ways for data to interact with a processing resource um, in a way that this could work and be optimized. But there was always trade-offs, right? So I couldn't just go into login nodes and look at data whenever I wanted to. It, it had to be a block process. I had to wait days for my compute to finish. Um, there were different stages of failure, stages of exceptions. The virtual environment could fail. The overall job could fail, um, and I kind of realized that supercomputing wasn't wasn't as on its feet as I wanted it to be to solve these problems. And and, at, and the administration really let me know that in the first days I was running on Comet, 
I was told pretty often, hey, stop running servers in the login node. Um, stop making trillions of files. Those were actually chunks of files to represent those different giant image volumes and distribute them to processes. And over time, after almost crashing Comet a bunch of times, I decided that I needed to look for another resource that would fulfill this, this, this looping problem I'm describing here, which is where you, get, you have your equipment, which goes to your data, to your data server. You know, imagine going in there and making a Linux operation for each one of those. How much time does that take? How often do you have to update it? You know, it's, it's just not possible to a certain degree. And what kind of system can we envision where it's just about the data and the problem and everything else has become a greater, I don't want to use the word abstraction because it's kind of overused in computer science, but it becomes an abstraction of, of where your challenge is such that when I'm asking for a processor, when I'm asking for a chunk of data, those processes are just handled by these high level Python software and middleware libraries that can execute on wherever you want to and can scale with respect to each other, with respect to their individual processes, which with respect to their batches, even with respect to their futures. So like a stage that executes further in the process can start executing earlier based on data flow parallelization. Um, so on the left here, I'm distributing where all of these problems come from. So if you, if you have this pristine mouse brain, you can, you can develop what's typically referred to as a standard connectomics workflow, where you're just taking a group of AIs and you're, you're, you're refining pixel data in a way that it can be most easily segmented. But when you look at non-mammalian data, um, data that has correlated probe structures, which can um, enhance the amount of data in the space, but they might requ require other microscope engineering methods that decrease the signal to noise ratio and you know, affect the pristinity of whatever it is you're operating on. When you start asking about um, you know, what if my data is absolutely massive? If you have absolutely massive data, there's probably a different preparation protocol that would result in different le levels of contrast. All of these things require different um, ways to approach them. You need, you need a workflow that actually changes and is, is composed of a bunch of different applications. So everything I'm, I'm distributing here, every little box here is actually an AI that is, is tasked with solving a specific, a specific task. Um, except for around three of them. I think the data and augmentations, the instance augmentation, and the image registration, those are all regular, those are non-AI processes. However, they are GPU-enabled processes. So every box I'm showing you here is a high-performance GPU stage that can be a path to solve all the problems you see on the left towards that reconstruction of wiring and synapses and ways that we can get quantitative data out of those systems. Now, the, the most pressing problem here is how if you know your CUDA graphics process, that an NVIDIA processor, how do you take huge multidimensional image data? You know, it's 3D image data. It's not video data, but there is a third dimension that's spatial, it's not time. And how do you take that and reduce it in a way that you can't with supercomputing and central processing tasks? Because all these supercomputers, they could have tens of thousands of processors, high memory nodes, all of those things are off the table. You have a, you have VRAM, and a CUDA process, and you have to reduce everything towards that stage. And I used to do this by like, you know, de defining hyper partitions and partitions and different types of workflow management software. And over time, I, I've realized that the future is really going to be defined by actually having all of those be transformed into services that stream out everything in a, in a micro process that's as small as possible and makes the data and system operate on these really small batches that operate in a very different way. So I'm going to um, jump through every single AI I have in that system I just presented. The most simple one and the easiest to show is just content aware image restoration. This is where the image comes through and for some for some reason in the in the in the protocol the preparation either at the microscopy level the biological specimen uh, level uh, all the way up to the birth of the human or mouse or fly or whatever we're imaging there could have been some something that influenced um, their system that isn't handled by um, the you know delicate engineering and microscopes and biological product protocols in that their image data could just be you know lower quality. But you can always take higher quality data and use it as a target and and resample that data or refeatureize it or restyle it in a way where it looks crisp. And that is one of the most basic ways you can just standardize a range of inputs across different species or um, resolutions. Another another way tackling resolution more directly is is what if your data has um, deficits in X Y Z, or you're modifying the process to produce more image data, um, but you want um, you want more throughput, like a greater extent, and so you might um, cut thicker slices, 
or you might scan at lower resolutions and you'll get data that is of lower resolution, but all these AIs, these segmenters that are operating later in the workflow, they're, they're used to a certain high resolution um, data space where they can see exactly the structure they're gonna see. Um, and there's been a lot of innovation really specifically in the past two to three years um, in internal learning where you take an image and you just have a convolutional neur neural network scan across it, extract all of its features, superimpose them on each other, and go back in and 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 upsample the volume to to magnify it um, just using nothing but the image itself. Um, this requires not just a bunch of of uh, different type of neural network layers, but actually many neural networks. Um, they're based on more complex objectives, adversarial objectives, um, um, few shot learning objectives. Um, they're they're cohorts of AIs where different um, units of them are used at training or inference. Um, and you can imagine where you're asking, okay, well, I, I have this huge exabyte volume of mouse brain. How do I get, you know, a group of 20 to 30 neural networks to work together in a consort to um, get me to that end stage, that, that mapped neuron, that reconstructed synapse, that quantitative data I want. Um, so this is a video of that super resolution process showing how it can eat up at least um, gigavoxel information. So the, the top I'm showing three major brain regions, uh, cerebellum in the upper left, hippocampus in the upper middle, and um, cortex in the upper right. And in the top row, um, an AI has gone in and just added a slice to the Z-stack. Um, and you can see on the bottom one, hopefully this is streaming fast enough, but you can see how there's kind of a blocky movement of these of these structures across 3D, where in the top it's a lot smoother. And this actually enhances the ability of a downstream AI to uh, use this data to reconstruct the neurons because it has more information to go off of. Um, at the same time, this is an AI that actually changes the dimensions of the image. It outputs twice as many pixels. Um, you can even think of greater variations of the same AI. Um, this is one that takes electron tomography, which Mark introduced, um, and uses it as a target resolution as an extra modal way of saying, well, here is a very, very high resolution data set of the same data. Can you take the low resolution data set and translate it in a way? You can see how this, uh, this is a myelinated axon right here, and this is the same myelinated axon. Um, but this, this volume on the right has, has over 10 times the amount of resolution on the z-axis, as well as around five to 10 times more resolution on the x and y-axis. Um, and so an, a, a greater variation of that AI I introduced in the earlier slide could be used in this one where it recursively calls itself to keep adding slices and then to look at the uh, target resolution volume. Um, so there's not just a single AI at any stage in one of these workflows. There's actually you know, the single AI with its more simple uniform purpose, but you can expand on that um, using greater objectives and more data. Um, this is one of those non-AI processes that is also um, capable of being compiled on a GPU and um, distributed in a way that um, using these composable heterogeneous resource pools is very ad advantageous. Um, so this is a tiling al algorithm. Um, whenever these electron microscopes take these absolutely massive images, they, they scan um, a, a minimally viable um, spatial extent, which is which is not which is some infinitesimally small fraction of the greater volume, um, and then you have to align all these tiles um, in groups and group them together and super tile them, and then eventually you get to that final 3D block of tissue that can then be segmented and analyzed. Um, but what's different about this tiling algorithm is if you look closely at at each of these colors, these individual algorithms, you can see that the image is distorting in different ways. These are known as affine or, or, or projective transformations. Um, and those transformations are based on matrix multiplication, which vis-a-vis -vis means that these can be put in on GPU. That's actually why I'm aligning multiple tiles at once is because this operation can happen so rapidly that I can actually do many tiles at once. This is almost all of these algorithms previously are based on just aligning one tile to another and just procedurally building a mosaic one tile at a time. Um, but with these more advanced GPU enabled optimizations, you can much like an AI optimize many parameters at once and build bigger and more capable scientific algorithms to embellish and enhance your, your greater workflow. Um, and then here I'm showing just examples from one of our collaborations with Harvard University, where one of these absolutely massive image data um, acquisitions occurred to acquire an image that was sufficiently large enough to encompass a major brain region in the mouse. Um, this is the um, specifically the mouse cerebellum. Um, this is a 
incomprehensibly huge um, image with 60 billion pixels a slice, and there's um, over 10,000 of those slices, and the just a single slice can't load into any conventional programming environment. You know, even on an HPC node, if you just ask for one unit of one dimension, you can't actually have it. Um, so I'll go later into some of the cyber infrastructure and services that enable you to, to seamlessly develop algorithms to deal with that anyway. Um, this is probably one of my most expansive applications I've built uh, fairly recently, which is this idea of if, if we want to go into the brain and say, well, here's, here's the neurons, here's the synapses, um, and I want it to be robust and dynamic, well, why can't I just sit down and say, okay, well, this is what neurons should look like based on a simulation. So projecting the wiring through space, which is what you're seeing in the upper left. Um, also projecting the astrocyte tissue, which is what this big yellow um, extrusion is up here. And then also filling in all of those subcellular components and doing it in a comprehensive enough way that you create a simulated image, which has all your label data. Because otherwise you have to train these AIs with human annotated data. And you know a human has to go in, look at the real data and label all the structures. One way you could, you know, cheat that, that process is to just simulate the data because the simulation is going to have the labels. Um, and then once you get up to, to the simulated image, it doesn't look quite good enough. It doesn't look like any of the electron microscopy images you've seen so far, but you can take an AI who will take you that last leg of the way. Um, this is an example of that. On the left, I have a little outcropping of, a, of an electron microscopy image from the barn owl brain, um, a little part of its its um, unique avian micro um, neural microcircuit. And then in the middle, I have one of these simulated images. And then on the right, I have um, an AI who looked at that barn owl brain and then looked at that simulated image and said, hey, can I take the features from the barn owl brain and place them on the simulated image such that I could um, create ground truth? And I, and I had it working. Um, Pretty, pretty good, and this is the most exciting application for me because this eliminates the biggest human in the loop part of these processes, which is having humans come in and trace neurons and trace subcellular structures, because that is the most expensive time consuming process that can take hundreds or even thousands of hours. Um, and so that idea that an AI could couple with the simulation and do this for us is, uh, could, could eliminate one of the greatest human costs to doing these kinds of um, brain wiring reconstructions. Um, this is, uh, I'll go through all of my experimental use cases. This is a um, sample from a human who suffered from Alzheimer's disease uh, over 60 years ago. Um, and we have a pristine uh, sample of, it, of said patient's brain where we can see all of these pathological structures that are involved in Alzheimer's disease, like tangles of proteins that shouldn't be there, agglomerations of proteins that shouldn't be there, um, inside of cells, outside of cells, alongside blood vessels. And we also have an image that looks a lot like a mouse image. So I'm putting a mouse image, some of these classic ones I've shown you on the left, and then I'm putting that human gym image there. It had you know, a very different type of processing protocol when it came to the microscopes and, and staining procedures. Um, but we can see that it's, it's similar. We can still see synapses. We can still see mitochondria. We can still see the same amount of structures. So can we make AIs that are big and expansive enough to work in cohorts that they could look at that data and say, oh yeah, I can, I can figure that out. You know, it might, it might require, you know, for this, for this application, I added a little, um, a second pass AI where the segmenter just took a second look to make, to double check that it was marking the right structures. And then there you go, that's your composed application that is now able to take data from a much greater problem space. Um, and so this down here is some reconstructions of human neurons, human human astrocyte and human vessels and all their subcellular and the signal from all their subcellular structures um, in a way that required, once again, every box I'm showing you is a different AI process um, pitched on, on, on these cyber infrastructures. Um, this is another uh, use case involving um, labeling chemistry where you don't exactly know the precise identity or context of any neuron in the brain and unless you do two things. One is you take like a huge volume of it where you can take, uh, where you can see where it came from and where it goes, where did its dendrites come from, where did its axons goes, and then you can infer what kind of neuron it is, or you can label them and say, you know, if you're if you're using these transcription factors to grow and define yourself and your molecular profile, we can hack those transcription uh, factors with genetic tools to also put in labeling chemistry and whether it's fluorescent or EM. And actually build AIs that also mark those structures, and then we can get quantitative data that which is enriched with the case that we're labeling. 
um, and do the classic science where you have your, your in-group and your out-group and you do statistics and figure out, you know, what do dopaminergic neurons look like? What do um, glutamate producing neurons look like? And, you know, how, how, do, how do these microstructures, which we really know very little about, you know, can we finally create the cohort of technologies necessary to resolve their most basic characteristics? Um, and Matthew, this is Lauren. Uh, this is a two minute warning. Yep. Okay. Um, I'm going to skip over this then. Uh, I'm going to go really quickly into some of the cyber infrastructure. I'm going to go way too fast over it. Um, this all comes from a, a level of abstraction that has to do with data and, and putting it into containers, whether those are operating system containers in the, in the context of Docker or data containers in the context of high level libraries that are designed to work on cloud infrastructure. Um, such that when I'm doing these processes, it's happening anywhere and and any kind of batch partition can understand what its context is and what data it needs to do and what algorithm it needs to produce, what kind of processing unit it needs. And these containers also contain all these other extra things that help you define bigger and better AIs and scientific algorithms, like connections to Jupyter, um, connections to um, itself or configurations of the Kubernetes engine itself. Um, this happens in, in a big ecosystem of different services that are running large GPU pools, pools or they're doing large simulations, but they're doing them all largely synchronously off of the same unit of Docker. And actually that, that little green layer on the bottom of Docker, that's, that's a crude runtime data. So we're staging these Docker containers all over these ecosystems, but as they run, they're doing something and that puts data in the, run, in the operating system. And that is its own layer, which can be um, transmitted to all of these all of these processes wherever. So you can have these GPU processes that need more memory or need more CPU or they need to scale down. Um, and they do it statelessly within their own states such that threads expand and contract in groups of Docker containers on these nodes. So you can put much more larger um, processes that are much more efficient and optimized in, in smaller, more efficient microservice resource pools. Um, this happens Currently, mostly just on the national research platform across a, a distributed GPU grid. Expanse has recently brought online and has some of these technologies to act as an endpoint. And then the three major cloud providers, Microsoft, Google, and AWS, also contain endpoints for Kubernetes engines. And we're working with a, a federation software that allows you to define the most fundamental compute in Kubernetes, which is known as a pod, and intercept that pod as it's defined and distribute it to all these providers in a way that you can do this all in one um, big federated circumstance, which I'm plotting here. I copied this figure this morning from a meteorological website, um, the clouds with vertical development that was already in there. Um, but I, this is actually a very uh, good figure when it comes to the scale of what's happening. And what makes us different than standard high performance computing system is whenever you're dealing with a problem, regardless of the scale of it, I, sh I, so I showed three different scales here. Um, Exa, Peta, and Terra, but all of them run through the neuro, the, the natural research platform. Your application is there. All the bits and pieces are there to run everything you need to. And the storage clusters are actually decoupled. They're their own pods, their own systems that are connecting to each other in these streams, such that when the Docker container goes to Expanse, goes to Microsoft, goes to Google, that they all maintain those connections in, in, in a way that the computation can keep running with whatever pool you need and this is a this is a scaling that's happening per application. It's not the whole thing. So you could have one AI that 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 goes into the petascale, you know, like a resolution booster is going, putting twice as many pixels out. So suddenly it needs expanse uh, nodes into the pool, or we're doing this massive compute with this with these home mouse frame regions. In which case we need to, you know, step back and rethink. Okay, well we need to start federating all of these cloud providers, um, which is much easier than defining typical batch supercomputer processes, whether they're on LSF or SLURM execu uh, executors on um, Department of Energy or National Science Foundation. Um, super and Matthew, I'm going to have to ask you to wrap it up because we're out of time. We still want to have some time for Q&A. OK, um, so this is just showing that it's all data flow parallelized, um, which is a big thing I do when I program these systems, so different applications, but they all just couple together and they um, loop with themselves um, synchronously throughout the entire workflow. Um, this is just showing these new types of machine learning evaluations where you're uh, you're evaluating multiple groups of models with multiple groups of hyperparameters against other multiple groups of models, which is a more expansive way of validating and evaluating how your workflow works.
And I have some really fancy videos and I'm sorry, I'm gonna skip, but I'm just gonna, the last thing I'm gonna do is show this video, which is um, a 3D, just traveling through one of these fully labeled volumes and showing you just the grandeur of, of and, and, and letting you picture in your mind, you know, what kind of compute is needed to do what you're seeing here. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, very informative and rich presentation. Uh, if I could ask uh, people to uh, turn on their cameras and we have uh, time for uh, just about 15 minutes of Q&A. So, uh, so we did have a question in the chat. Let's start there then, Jeff. Um, so this came from Gene, Gene Miller. Um, and it's for Matthew. Um, and ha have you, he, he asks, have you tested whether the pre-processing content aware or super resolution uh, creates artifacts that negatively impact the final results? Uh, yes. Yeah, so actually one of those evaluations I showed was, was to address that question more specifically. I've and there's there's two different ways I've tested this. One of it is is that quantitative. You know, I'm going to label the structures, and then I'm going to do the super resolution. And then I'm not going to do it, and then I'm going to show that, you know, the boundaries of the structures don't augment it. And I'm not I'm not the only person who does this technique. Um, there's there's a couple other groups that do them, and they show that, you know, when they segment the structures, the F1 scores go up. Uh, does that mean there are or aren't art artifacts? That's not necessarily answer that question. There could be more artifacts, but as long as you're getting better F1 results against your label data. Um, it doesn't necessarily matter. Um, and then the other thing I've done is I'll, I'll, whenever I generate these volumes, I'll just show them to a bunch of microscopists like Mark and, and others, and I'll just say, hey, can you identify which slice is generated or not? Um, and if they can't, then that means there weren't any computational artifacts. There could still be artifacts that are unreal structures that shouldn't be there. Um, but that's a big question, and it, and, it, and it has to do a lot with just generative AI in general. And, and, and really the question is how far do we push it? You know, if I'm doubling resolution, that's really not a question that I care about. But if, if I'm doing 10 times more resolution, then it's a huge question. Um, so, and it, and it affects a lot of fields beyond microscopy. Um, but no, so, I haven't uh, found it negatively affects um, And Jeff, was that the only question on the, in the queue? Or we throw it open? In, in the chat, yeah, that was the only question. All right, thank you, Matthew. And, uh, Let's throw the, the mic open for anybody to ask a question of any of the speakers. And Alvi, you're muted. Your Zoom mic is muted in Zoom. Nope. Any questions? Who has the first question after this first question, second question? Well, seeing that there are no questions, it's time for a drink. <laughs> it's a lot. I, I have a question for um, Ilkay. Um, it, you know, I've I've sort of watched the the progression um, of these composable systems, um, you know, through your presentations over the years, and I'm just wondering how much of this work is specific to the domain and how much of it is um, generalizable? Um, is it, in other words, is it getting easier to do these things or is it getting harder to do these things? It is getting easier um, because of the technology stacks that are evolving. Kubernetes is a good example, but when you think about it, it meant to pull together resources initially through Google who initiated it on top of the same data domain. So if you take that and say, okay, now you can also combine storage resources and networking resources, it requires different or different types of um, sort of namespaces for doing different computing that comes from different collaborative spaces. Right? When you think about all of this, um, there is a growth pain, so to say, to bring new systems into the ecosystem that we can properly study. So they're happening as new requirements evolve. Uh, so it's getting easier, but it's still the solutions aren't 
generalizable, right? Uh, it still requires some expertise to do the right amount of resources, so you can execute a workflow across that. But once it's built for a problem, it's going to generalize to that type of problem. So we can keep using the same federation. And the main thing here, I think, to recognize is <laughs> it wasn't doable, now it's doable. <laughs> so that's a huge jump, right? And that's the exciting part of that as well. Thank you. Martin, I, have I have a question. I have a question for Mark. And so you said uh, that uh, the early uh, early attempts to map the neurons looked at, you know, or visualized mostly the dendrites and skipped over this really amorphic mass that fills the space between them. And you made a passing comment just now about how that might be the, the residence of the soul. And uh, one of the things that's fascinated me is that the brain is capable of all this processing at only 20 watts power. And uh, you know, some people have argued that it's it's the way it does the process and the fact that it's so sparsely, you know, uh, sampling, in fact, uh, where where Matthew has explained how dense sampling creates this enormous compute challenge that counts probably, you know, kilowatts of computing. And yet the brain is doing all this stuff on almost no power at all very quickly. Do you, are we down to the level, Mark, where you, you understand exactly what's happening and how thought is being processed? Only on the right drugs. <laughs> um, sorry, at least I got to chuckle. I think that um, from an information theory perspective, you have to take a step backwards to the 50s. That's easy for you, Lauren. I think you can go there. Um, and my hair is tied back in a ponytail, you know. But you can, if, if you want an information system and you want to store information as an activated circuit or an activatable circuit, you're in deep kimchi pretty quickly in terms of the increase in utilization of energy as the system has more resident information. So any good information theorist, even in the early days of Shannon would tell you that the majority of information should be stored as the null response. Mm -hmm. Meaning that mm -hmm. if you wanna store information, don't require it to be active. Look at the shadow of the information. So, for example, if you have a stand of trees, highly organized in a forest, and you send a strong wind through the trees and all of them bend, bending would be their activation electrically in the way we think of the brain. Think about a few trees that have figured out how to not bend. They're not excited. If you had a detector at the, the lee side of the forest that then could interpret that perturbation in the wind created by a few trees that didn't behave normally, you'd be able to decode their lack of bending, their null response. We don't think of the brain in such an exotic metaphor at all. We think of it because we've been, we've, we're sort of in a Newtonian view when we've already moved to quantum physics, if you like, in thinking as Cajal taught us that it's the wiring. And then we keep making these circuit metaphors and these computer metaphors, which really don't apply if you wanna to move to a system that is parsimonious energetically. 
So I, I think that, you know, we, we're fools in oversimplifying and trying to draw metaphor because the system probably doesn't work that way. Now I gave reference to the glial cells, the non-neuronal cells, which have largely been ignored because they don't send signals over long distance. They don't form these kinds of reflex wiring and, and, and sort of thing. But they have traveling waves of information, of chemical information that travel through them and course across the brain, very much like the wind that I described in the forest. So I think we're still, it's our hubris that keeps us from thinking well enough <laughs> or, or diligently enough about how the system might work. And it's the tyranny of scale and detail across scales that prevents us from, I think, moving to a new, uh, how would you say, uh, framework. And it's the way science is funded. Um, so there, there's very little true creative thought in the business. It's just incrementalism. And we're going to continue to look at metaphors like computer wiring, and I think that's a mistake. Thank you. Uh, I think we have uh, more than enough time for a few more questions. Lauren, anybody want to jump on any of that? Yeah, Lauren. Go ahead, Howie. Um, from a kind of sky high layman's perspective, it seems like a tremendous amount of work has begun. I'm wondering if there's a few examples of kinds of really significant insights that have occurred over the last decade using the technology, you know, across the visualization and computing resources that have been cited, where it has really begun to change our uh, generalized concept about what's going on up there. So this is change, insights regarding neuroscience or neuroanatomy. And so uh, Mark, maybe that goes back to you again. Well, there have been several large scale investments to do small scale wiring. So the Howard Hughes uh, Institute at uh, uh, just outside of Dulles Airport, Genalia Farm, put a massive amount of money in a $500 million building into uh, funding laboratories to get the wiring of the Drosophila sort of forcing the issue of how you do the wiring using the sort of methods that Matthew showed. And some of the work Matthew showed is actually from that area. Yeah, Drosophila, fruit fly. Thank you, Jeff. The um, outcome was a complete map of the synaptic connections of the Drosophila. Publicly available. People are mining it. People are looking at it in a way that uh, is looking for insights about different aspects of fruit fly behavior. I don't think there have been any uh, remarkable breakthroughs yet. My friends at Genalia might argue with me, but the breakthrough is that the wiring in, its, in and of itself isn't quite enough. It's a requirement to have but we still don't understand how the communications are going on beyond the simplest uh, ideas that emerged nearly a century ago of chemical synapses. So uh, we need to keep with the wiring. Now there's a big push to do the wiring of the entire mouse brain, be a couple billion dollars. But I think without some uh, infusion of notions of how the, the communication is achieved other than synapses, uh, we'll probably just be continuing down the kind of wiring notions that have kept us trapped uh, with somewhat uh, limited concepts. So breakthroughs, we're waiting. So just a short follow-up. So where might AI come into being able to change the axis of our approach? Well, the AI is largely influencing 
the bottlenecks and the throughput. We're still dealing with machines to acquire the data that usually cut it up in one or another way. There are some attempts to use beam lines at synchrotrons because you know agencies have them and they're underutilized to some extent as ways of getting a 3D map by, by uh, projections as opposed to cutting it up. But in the end, uh, I think all of them are going to use uh, AI to try and divine out information because there aren't enough people <clears throat> trained well enough to pull out the information that needs to be summarized, quantified. So AI is helping there. It's helping to improve the quality of data, as Matthew showed. Uh, it, I think it remains to be seen whether or not what we're picking out are the relevant bits, because it's on, the only things we pick out are the things that we put heavy metals on in order to get contrast with one or another of the particle beams. And that's only about 30 to 40% of the piece parts. So it's like putting together a more and more detailed map without actually seeing the components that may be critical to the action. Thank you. Like the water I talked about. Thank you very much. That was really interesting. Uh, one more question, if anybody has it. Well, then, thank you very much, uh, Professor Ellsman, Professor Altinas, Matthew. Uh, it was an extremely dense and rich talk, but it all really was part of a whole. And uh, I really appreciate the three of you taking the time to prepare and to uh, coordinate your, your talks. It, uh, it was uh, really excellent. We'll record this and share it. and. Uh, uh, we'll have another session tomorrow, uh, starting at 10 a.m. Uh, Pacific time uh, for the people who always come in the second day. And uh, I really want to thank everybody. It was, uh, I learned a lot myself, and I'm uh, full of questions. Uh, I think that the most fascinating thing I heard today, besides the wonderful pictures and the history, was this idea that you can take existing data, model it, create a simulation, and then throw your observed data on the simulation as the first approximation to save time of the humans to do the metadata la labeling. And uh, to take the human out of the loop on metadata, and I'm calling metadata what you called labeling, all right? And that's a universal problem, uh, uh, whether it's uh, in, in microscopy or in other types of imaging or in uh, uh, media analysis or anything I can imagine. So that's really quite interesting work. Uh, thank you so much, everybody. And uh, we'll see you, I hope, uh, in August uh, to hear about the biography of the pixel and in coming months as well.